Uh, my name is Sharka Grofova and uh, I work at the Open Science Support Center at Tours University in Prague and I'm going to introduce you to the basic principles of the open access publishing model. Uh, the language of instruction is English and this webinar is a part of the event Open Access Week 2020 and it is being recorded. So by staying here, you give us uh, your consent uh, with the recording. We are using the Adobe Connect system. You can write into the chat in the right, left, uh, right bottom uh, corner. And uh, or you can raise your hand in case you have questions or a comment. Uh, so please feel free to use this chat to write your questions and comments there. And by the end of the presentation, there is going to be uh, room for discussion. So I'm going to start with the definition of uh, open uh, science in general and the context that has made it a resonating topic among the academic community across the world. Uh, then I'm going to explain what the open access publishing model actually entails, the difference between green and gold open access, and uh, I'm going to talk briefly about unfair practices in scholarly communication that exploit the idea of open access. So let's get started. I'm going to switch off my camera for better, better connection. Okay. So there are many perspectives from which we can define open science. Very generally, uh, it is a movement that makes the uh, scientific research and the dissemination accessible at all levels. Society, amateur, okay, sorry, uh, we just had a little drawback with the, uh, with the presentation, but it should be okay right now. So, as I said, uh, Open science advocates for uh, scientific research and its dissemination accessible at three levels, society, amateur, or professional. It encompasses practices such as publishing open research, open access, and in general, making it easier to communicate scientific knowledge. One way to look at uh, open science in according to what it aims at, for example, more effective use of research findings and outputs, better repro uh, reproduction in reusability of research and by doing so reducing the collection uh, of uh, like duplicates of data or materials. Uh, that consequently also leads to campaigning for open access publishing model. Um, when I give this broad and exhaustive explanation of what open access is, I often get this look in return. Uh, why should we bother? Why is this a topic that we should be discussing and we should, uh, we should highlight and pronounce in uh, academic society? The purpose of this presentation is to offer you uh, reasons why we should pay attention uh, to this topic from a wide range of perspectives, from a researcher to a parent. I will attempt to explain why there is a whole Open Science Support Center at Charles University devoted to this issue and why you might be hearing about this more often recently. And the first reason is related to the one thing that has affected everyone's life this year tremendously. The COVID-19 pandemic shed light on how essential open science principles are. Uh, this global emergency calls for accelerating the pace of research and data sharing more than anything. According to Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, or shortly uh, SPARC, and I quote, while researchers world over are working hard to find a vaccine and effective drugs, and many publishers and service providers have stepped up to provide research and information open access temporarily, researchers are still missing out on relevant publications, software, and research data that remained out of reach. Therefore, we are here and open access is one of the ways scholarly communication can uh, be accelerated. 
Open science is a very broad term and it covers a wide range of related topics that each would deserve its own presentation. Today, I'm going to talk only about open access, which as you can see, is only a fraction of uh, what open science entails. Open access is an initiative proposing a new publication model that ensures that everyone has access to scientific information, that the access is not conditioned by subscriptions or affiliation to a university, that research results are equally accessible to everyone, regardless of sociological or economical status or geographical indication. There are four basic principles of open access. It should be immediate, which means that the access should be provided at the latest when the articles or results are provided, sometimes even, even before that. Free, in the sense free of charge for the end user. Permanent, so that the access should be provided in the long term and results must be archived, stored, and the long archivation should be, should be secured. And it should be independent. Uh, therefore, results shouldn't be only re for for reading, so read only, but should be published so that they can be reused. For example, by uh, publishing under a public license, such as Creative Commons, etc. However, introducing a new publishing model is a complex issue that brings many problems and require change in publication behavior as such. So a natural question that occurs uh, is why do we actually need a new publishing model to adhere to open science principles? Can we practice open science with the traditional publishing model? The answer to this question is nicely described by this infographics that was uh, produced by colleagues from the Queensland University of Technology. <clears throat> by looking at the individual steps of a publication process, you can see that the subscription-based model rather slows down scientific progress by locking uh, published articles behind, behind paywall and transferring full copyright to the publisher. Once article is published uh, and put behind the paywall, libraries and public in general must pay for subscription and often have to face financial obstacles that hinder access to up-to-date information. And it does not concern only authors, right? Researchers, but also students of universities or other schools that are working on, it, on their thesis and general public, they often see something like this uh, when they want to look up information online. Uh, <clears throat> this is the main reason why a subscription-based publishing model is considered not inclusive enough and Open Access Initiative proposes two new alternatives that would secure the the access to information to everyone with less limitations. As I said, there are two basic models. Sometimes you can hear of other colors of open access, not only green and gold, but also uh, bronze, etc. But today I'm going to talk about those two and I'm going to talk about each of them in more details. Green open access. It's a combination of publishing in a journal and so-called self-archiving, which means that the author themselves store their manuscript to an open repository, which is an online database that serves as a disposal site for open access materials. Uh, so the steps are as follows. Uh, research is conducted, manuscript is submitted to a journal. Uh, the journal can be subscription-based or an open access journal and uh, the article, the manuscript, undergoes a peer review. When it is accepted, author assigns copyright to the publisher, but retains the right to self-archive and open access copy. This usually must be negotiated within an amendment to the copyright transfer agreement. It's usually not uh, there by default. And the article is published uh, either immediately in an open access uh, journal or behind the paywall in case of subscription-based journal and after time embargo or other conditions 
author store the author store the open access copy to an open access repository and by that uh, make their wor uh, work or manuscript or article accessible to all by which the scientific progress should be accelerated Naturally, there are things to bear in mind when it comes to green open access. And at the first glance, it sounds very complicated and uh, very exhausting. Um, as I have already mentioned, uh, self-archiving must be in compliance with the license agreement of the publisher, who can set certain requirements or limits on the self-archiving regarding the stored version of the article. For example, you can only self-archive post print, preprint, or publisher version of the article. Uh, there can be a time embargo, so you can be allowed to self-archive several months after publication in the journal, or you can only self-archive in a certain type of a repository. Uh, self-archiving of the preprint version of an article, which means uh, uh, the version before it un undergoes the peer review process is also possible. As I mentioned, it can, the access can be even before uh, the peer review. However, those articles must be approached critically as there has not been any quali quality validation. However, it can be a rich source of feedback from the community. And again, it's a, it's a faster and newer way of uh, communicating information. It is often very difficult to find information you need to go green open access, but Sherpa Romeo can help. This is a database of uh, license requirements of journals in relation to self-archiving. So you can look up the journal according to a publisher's name or the uh, ISSN number, and it states the time embargo, the type of repositories and all the other requirements that can, can occur. Uh, it is, however, only refer referential, and what is 100% valid is what you find on the publisher's web page. Still, this is a very useful tool that can uh, help you uh, get your head around all the license agreement uh, conditions and, uh, and uh, to see what you are actually allowed to do. An uh, equally useful tool is a directory of open access repositories that one can use to find uh, a suitable uh, open access repository once uh, you have, you have uh, negotiated the self-archiving terms in the copyright agreement. When you take both those steps, meaning being in compliance with the copyright agreement with the journal, and being allowed to self-archive and choosing a suitable uh, open repository, uh, you have secured open access to your article or to your work uh, by the green road. Unlike the green road to open access, gold open access means publishing directly in open access journals. Therefore, Open access is secured by the publisher, not the author. After an article undergoes peer review and is accepted to be published, authors grant uh, publish the uh, publisher the license to publish. Excuse me. Uh, so the author grants the publisher a license uh, to publish and retains copyright to his work. Often it is required to pay so-called article processing charges, uh, APCs, and uh, right after the article is published, it is immediately accessible to public. Thanks to granting open licenses to the article, uh, the work can be reused, and again, the scientific progress speeds up. Gold open access is often mistaken for the whole open access model. And many people think it is a fraudulent practice when the, uh, authors simply pay to get published without any quality validation. To debunk this myth, I have listed three types of open access journals. There are pure or diamond open access journals that uh, charge no APCs, no article processing charges, and uh, the 
the journal is uh, funded or financed by uh, by the publisher itself. It is usually institution, universities, etc. Uh, then there are those paid open access journals that charge charge authors uh, one time payment of uh, article processing charge. And uh, the third type is a so-called hybrid journal where article processing charge is optional, uh, was supposed to be a, a transition model from the subscription-based journal to the open access journal, but um, publishers realized that it's actually a nice business model when they are getting paid for the subscriptions and occasionally for APCs when the authors decide that their article uh, should be accessible uh, freely and openly. So yeah, this is a this is also an option, and this is also part of the gold open access uh, route. Um, what is good to remember is that you can still self archive your manuscript when publishing in an open access journal. Therefore, uh, green and gold roads uh, to open access can be combined. And again, to highlight and specify and uh, stress is that every open access journal does a peer review. Otherwise, it is considered a journal of questionable quality, so-called predator, topic that we will get to in a bit. To find the right open access journal, you can use directory of open access journals, VOAJ, and uh, Uh, every journal listed in this database must meet their entry requirements. For example, the hybrid journals are not included in this database. So even though, again, it's only a refer referential source, we consider it a certainly reliable source of information about open access journals. So what to bear in mind when it comes to gold open access? The article processing charges are, of course, the most discussed uh, factor of gold open access. It is true that publishers often set the APC price very high and often seek to take advantage of this new publishing uh, model, or this business model, let's say. APC can be often uh, covered by grants and more and more financial providers, such as European Union or European Commission, include open access to their requirements. Uh, so it's uh, not necessarily only the author himself who pays the APC from his pocket. It usually can be uh, can be covered by grants and other sources. But as I already mentioned, unfortunately, there are many entities that exploit uh, the idea of gold open access by charging authors for APC and publishing uh, and publishing articles without any quality check. Oh, and other uh, other standards in scholarly communication. As I said, we call them predators, and I'm going to talk about them a bit more in the next part of this presentation. Predators in scholarly communication are usually commercial entities posing as service providers to the scientific community. However, their purpose is to generate profit by collecting uh, money for the APC, uh, so the public, uh, publishing charges or conference fees, and they don't adhere to the publishing ethics. So they don't do peer review, and they don't do quality uh, academic work. So they don't adhere to the established standards of uh, scientific communication. Uh, most often we meet uh, the so-called predatory journals or publishers, uh, and that exactly is what uh, uh, what was already said before, that they misuse the model of paid open access journals. What we try to do at our Open Science Support Center is to highlight and raise the awareness that a predatory journal is not an open access journal. That is not what, uh, what the philosophy of open access entails. It's definitely not in line with the principles. And the paid open access journal is not always a predator. Yes, it's true that there are 
predatory journals that uh, claim to be open access, but open access goes with certain, st certain standards and ethics. And usually those uh, journals of questionable quality, let's say, don't, don't follow them or don't, don't meet those standards. So how do we do it? How do we raise the awareness? Um, we can warn or inform uh, academics about the characteristics of a predatory publisher. As you can see, uh, there is quite an exhaustive list of them and there is many, many more on the website of the Open Science Support Center. What is important to say is that the characteristics usually go hand in hand. It's not only one, one characteristics that would uh, definitely uh, say that a, that a publisher is fraudulent. And rather than reading out this exhaustive list, uh, I decided to show you rather some examples. Um, again, uh, what I'm going to repeat many times uh, in, during this presentation is that we cannot always 100% say clearly that a journal is a predator. It's really, really important to be careful and to be thorough and to do a little investigation into, <laughs> into the practices of the journal. And it's really, really, really essential to be careful before submitting a manuscript to any, any, any journal. There is a very uh, common question that we get when we talk about the predatory journals. Uh, and that is why don't we simply make a blacklist or a whitelist of either the pred predatory journals or the, the good ones, the, the high impacted quality journals, and we simply use only those. Well, it's not that easy. The reasons for including a journal in a blacklist uh, may not always be clear. And in extreme cases, it could lead to a legal dispute. Moreover, the quality of editorial work of a journal could change over time uh, due to changes in the management or changing the publisher, etc. So it's always necessary to look up the up-to-date situation, the state of the journal it is in at the moment you want to publish. So it's always necessary to individually assess the credibility uh, and uh, in the following part, I'm going to show you those, uh, uh, those mentioned examples. The examples uh, show always the certain characteristics. As I said, they usually go together. And uh, yeah, OK, let's. It doesn't always have to indicate an unfair practice, what I'm going to show, but it's definitely, let's say, an impulse for more thorough investigation when you see something similar to what I'm going to show you. Okay, so this is the Contact Us uh, website or page of a website of a publisher, where you can see that they have two headquarters or two seats one in uh, Europe and one in North America. And in both cases, there is the street number missing. For example, in the uh, New York address, you have the postal code, then you have Wall Street, that I imagine is a very long street, and no, no number with, with that. It doesn't have to mean it's a, it's a predatory journal. Of course, it can mean a human error. And to leave some benefit of doubt, I decided to check the, the ISSN, the International Standard Series number of a, of a journal, of this journal, in the SSN portal and see where the headquarter is uh, stated there. In today's globalized world, it is not impossible that the headquarters of the journal are in another country. But in this case, it's already a third country. It's a very, very distant country from, from the previous ones. And it should definitely be taken as a red flag and initiate further investigation. Uh, just as a side note, this uh, ISSN portal 
is a very useful source because the ISSN number is uh, uniquely identi uh, is a unique uh, identification number of a publication or a magazine, and it usually uh, helps to find uh, further information about the journal in case you struggle to find information on the website, for example. Okay. Uh, another example is the British Journal of Science, which is a very vague title, which again does not have to be a determining uh, sign of a predator. Uh, they are very high quality journals that have this wide, uh, wide broad title or a field of expertise. Uh, however, usually smaller or new journals usually very much specialize them in a narrower uh, topic or field. Um, on the bottom, you can find information about all the services that index this journal. This is a common practice showing the quality of the journal. It is also an opportunity to look up more details. Uh, so I take their word that uh, they are being indexed by the Directory of Open Access Journal and I look them up again by their ESSN. but uh, no results found that match your search criteria. Uh, the fact that we cannot find the journal in the OAJ might indicate uh, fraudulent behavior. So they are boasting about being indexed by something that is actually not true. Or it, again, it can be a human error. It can be a typo in the ISSN. It can be uh, also updated, uh, outdated information on the website of the publisher. But again, this should be a uh, this should be an impulse for, for next steps, <clears throat> um, checking the quality of the journal. What is, on the other hand, a very strong impulse to doubt the quality and fairness of a publisher is when you see unusually short period between an article being received and being accepted. Knowing the, the reality of peer review processes, delivering a solid quality validation of a scientific article in four days is simply impossible. Uh, it requires a couple of days to actually get the article to the, uh, to the reviewers. And uh, yeah, we simply usually think that four days is like very, very, very ambitious and very, very unlikely. This is a very, uh, unfortunately, this is only a screenshot, but usually this is a very uh, colorful and lively, lively website that is all flashing and, and the letters are moving. And uh, uh, when we look in the right bottom corner, you can see that they, uh, they are proud to be indexed by academia.edu which, as I said, is a common thing to show those services that index your journal. However, um, what makes a journal look questionable or suspicious is when they state indexing by services that don't validate quality of the content. So there is no quality check, such as Academia Edu or, for example, Google Scholar. Simply, uh, this information doesn't tell us anything other than the journal try to fill the space on the website maybe simply it has no it has no information to us that the fact they are indexed by academia or google google scholar um, when it comes to scholarly publishing it, impact factor is an ever-present notion we, we all know that and the way predators exploit this fact is that they invent their own impact factors or lie about having a certain rating. So you can see this one has uh, about four or five of them uh, listed on their front page. Again, in all colors and, and all flesh, and it was all sparkly. Um, uh, so I decided to check uh, one of the one of the impact factors or the yeah one of the impact factors and to see whether it's really true. 
so I took the PIF, which I believe states for publication uh, impact factor, and I looked it up. It indeed exists. But then again, we should also uh, evaluate the quality or the, uh, the trustworthiness of such, a, such an impact factor. What can be, again, a red flag uh, when it comes to websites looking like this is the fact that their contact uh, email is on a, on a Google uh, email account, so a public email account, like uh, reliable sources or services usually have their own domain and it simply all looks a bit more professional. But again, um, it's always necessary to look at more than one, one factor. So I hope that so far I have offered you a couple of answers to the previously stated questions. Why should we bother with uh, open science and consequently with open access? Uh, I believe that everyone finds uh, their most important benefits of open access that are the closest to their interest and their philosophy or their, their work, their profession, etc. From the perspective of our department at Charles University, it is mostly the transparent and reproducible research. And uh, again, a side note, that's why uh, within our center, we also tackle the topic of uh, research data management and uh, our colleagues are also giving presentations about those topics very often and we can uh, you can find a lot of information about this topic on our website as well uh, then higher visibility of work which leads to better searchability which is something every author and every academic wants and that's the that's the reason why they usually get, go to us and uh, also how they how they usually argue against or pro open access depending the 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 point of view but uh, we believe that open access actually leads to higher visibility of work not the other way around uh, there is also uh, they already mentioned acceleration of scholarly communication uh, that could help in those emergency states such as the one we are in or the whole world is in at the moment. And it also uh, brings the democrat democratization of open access or access to scientific information, which again, not only the most prominent well of uh, institutions have the access because they have the money to actually subscribe to all the journals, but also, uh, also, like, yeah, simply everyone can have the access. So we are in a university environment, and as such, we can, I hope, agree or we can see how open access can bring benefits to students and researchers. But it also brings uh, many benefits to other, to other people. Um, here on this, uh, on this slide, uh, you can see a couple of stories listed from the article called 10 reasons why we need to smash paywalls now. You have the link in the bottom of the, of this slide. And it's, for example, apparent who has a son who is a schizophrenic and uh, would like to read the article about this, uh, about this disease or about this illness, sorry. And uh, yeah, here we often hear an argument that a uh, general public wouldn't understand the content of uh, such, a, such an academic article, but uh, I don't think that's the reason not to give them access to it. And uh, yeah, writing uh, research or science in a comprehensive way for for general public is also a step forward to more inclusive science. But that's uh, that's a bit of a different field of open science already. Uh, there are also many trainers uh, or educators out of uh, university. Um, 
env environment that need to keep up to date with their education or with their training. And uh, again, not every small or private uh, entities have the resources to to access or to pay for the access to all the information. And yeah, I think we can all agree again that learning doesn't stop when uh, you complete your university degree, that uh, lifelong learning is a very, very solid, ever-present term that we all embrace. And uh, still there is the problem that when a student finishes the studies, he pretty much loses all the, with the affiliation to the university, he or she uh, loses access to most of the information uh, related to the field of study. And uh, yeah, open access also offers a solution to this. But also there can be uh, reasons more private or personal. It's for example, to a patient who deals with, a, with an illness since many years and wants to actually learn more about uh, let's say the advance in the in the therapy or in this field and uh, also uh, pronounces that it could foster advocacy efforts uh, raising awareness about this uh, about this disease etc so it's not true that only doctors and researchers and academics need to know updated in or up-to-date newest information about uh, from a field that is, let's say, very very specific, such as such as medicine, uh, etc. There was another example that I didn't include to the slide, but I would like to mention because I haven't done it uh, so far. It can also happen that as an author of a uni university, you publish in a journal that is not not subscribed uh, subscribed by your affiliation affiliated university. So after publishing, you cannot even see how cited your article has been because you don't have access to that. It actually happens more often than you might think. It's not that long time ago. I actually heard this from uh, one of the academics from Charles University, which again is a is kind of a paradox and uh, unpleasant situation that should maybe make us think about how to make it make it easier. Okay, I mentioned that I work from uh, at the Open Science Support Center. We are a department of the Central Library of Charles University. And uh, we understand that all this might be a bit overwhelming and especially the green open access requires a bigger involvement from the author's side. So that's why we offer help. We offer assistance in choosing an appropriate open access journal we, uh, we can help uh, depositing published articles in those open repositories or databases, again, the green open access. We can give advice on, uh, let's say, uh, quality or trustworthiness of a, of a journal. But as I said, the whole uh, one section of the center deals with uh, research data management that they can help you with creating a data management plan, choosing the appropriate data repository. And uh, as uh, this is a very new and fresh, well, it's not that new, but now it's becoming a more prominent topic and it's very fresh and it's very lively and very much discussed. We offer training sessions in order to raise awareness and to help. So in case somebody wants to invite us to their diploma seminars or, or something like that, we are always happy to come and give a presentation, either a short couple of minutes, uh, let's say crash course into, into open access and research data management, or we can even give like a seminar long uh, presentation on, uh, on various topics. So we are, uh, we are here for everyone from Charles University. All the support that we provide is bilingual. So all, everything is in Czech and English. And uh, also one of the big uh, parts of our work, or let's say the 
uh, benefit of having the Open Science Support Center is that we administrate and coordinate the possible discounts on the article processing charges for uh, Charles University authors. There are a couple of possibilities how to get either a discount or a complete waiver of the APC, which, which is the publication fee for Gold Open Access. Uh, here on the screen, you can see uh, the, uh, the current ones. In most of the cases, they apply to corresponding authors from Charles University, and uh, more information can be found on the website of uh, Open Science Support Center and uh, also through, uh, through this presentation. When you click on, those, uh, on the flyers, they will always lead you to the, to the specific uh, or further information. Okay, so this was a uh, lot of information in a quite a compressed uh, form. So I would like to thank you for your attention and ask you whether you have any questions or any comments regarding this topic, then you please either click on the uh, upper line on the microphone icon. Or I actually have to, I think I actually have to uh, allow your microphone to speak, but you can raise your hand, which is the icon of a of a figure with a raised hand. So if you click on that, I will see that you can you want to share a comment or ask something, and I'm happy to happy to allow you <laughs> your your microphone. Okay, so seems like there are no, no questions. In case you come up with any questions later on after the presentation, please feel free to contact us on uh, openscience at cuni.cz. And also after uh, finishing this webinar, this session, you are going uh, uh, in case you want to check closer information that we have on our website, after this webinar, you are going to uh, have our website open in your browser. And also my colleague just sent a link to the, to the website in the comment chat here in Adobe Connect. So the right bottom corner, you can find a link to our website where you find all the information and the uh, and the contact details. So again, if you don't have any, if you don't have any questions or comments to this topic, I thank you very much for your attendance, for your for your attention, and I hope to see you maybe at uh, one of our future future presentations and webinars. And I hope to hope to hear from you at any at any occasion. Thank you very much. Stay stay safe and have a have a nice rest of the day.